Today, my guest is Professor Vanessa Cornett, who is the Director of Keyboard Studies and an Associate Professor of Music at the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis, St. Paul, where she teaches classes in music performance, education, mindfulness, and the contemplative nature of art and music. She's also a licensed hypnotherapist and a certified meditation instructor. So you can probably deduce by now that she is part of a very rarefied cohort of long-term mindfulness practitioners who are also professional musicians. So let's tune in to my talk now with Professor Vanessa Cornett. Welcome to the Wolf and Tune podcast, Vanessa Cornett. I, I'm in such a good mood because you have such a good sense of humor usually. And um, I'm really thrilled that uh, we found each other somehow. I don't remember how, but I'm thrilled we did. And um, so welcome. I am thrilled to be here. Yes. Uh, we're going to talk about your book because uh, that's something that I found to be full of good stuff uh, called Mindful Musician Mental Skills for Peak Performance. Well, thank you. Um, so, so let's talk about your practice. You say you've been practicing for 15 years. Well, I've been practicing mindfulness, gosh, for probably more like 30 years, but I've been r d digging into the research about mindfulness and um, the psychology of performance, I would say, for about 15 years. So how did you start? Why did you start? Um, I started with mindfulness, actually, to be honest, because my mother um, meditated and um, held sort of a study group in our home when I was growing up. And so I was always surrounded by adults who were contemplative, for lack of a better word. And so th that to me was not anything out of the ordinary. Um, I started meditating and practicing mindfulness um, really in grad school seriously. And I, I don't know if that was a stress release tactic that I was trying or if I was finding in a way the earliest sort of connections between music and mindfulness. Um, so it kind of grew very organically and slowly, um, as I did, I guess. Well, when you say you were practicing mindfulness, uh, what does that mean? Was it a Vipassana? Was it some other? Yeah, growing up, I tried a lot of different things. I tried transcendental meditation. I tried um, different kinds of meditation that honestly uh, my my mom was teaching and I'm, I'm really not sure now what it was I think I sort of clicked with Vipassana meditation and that's that's the meditation I teach for my students um, and that sort of is my go-to now as a grown-up so when you say you teach to your students is this uh, first of all these are music students you teach uh, you're the director of piano studies at, at the university where you teach at, at University right. of St. Thomas. Right. Um, when I teach mindfulness, though, that's actually a course that students can register for and they do not have to be music students. So if students um, register for my mindfulness or my meditation courses, um, they can be of any degree program. They just um, are interested in learning different mindfulness techniques. Ah, uh -huh, okay. So you, this general student population can take this course. It's, it's about right. mindfulness in general. Right. I see. Um, is there any... Well, I'm curious to know what kind of students you attract. Do you attract liberal arts? Do you attract mainly musicians or creatives or engineers? What do you get usually? Uh, yeah, and it's interesting. In the mindfulness classes, uh, many of those are offered through the our honors program. So um, most often I attract very high achieving superstar students who, um, which is a really fun population to work with, of course, because they want to do it right and they want to get the A and they want to see improvement. And um, it's just a very interesting population to work with. But, you know, my music majors, too. I mean, I think undergrad music students and graduate students as well, for the most part, are pretty high achieving in general just to get to where they are. So um, I suppose I attract students who are um, interested in a strong liberal arts education. Um, and they're also interested in 
I guess for lack of a better word, holistic education, you know, learning more than just different subjects in the curriculum. So, you know, the book that you wrote, Mindful Musician, about mental skills for peak performance, um, and I'm saying the title again, not to, not to, as a promotion, but because uh, <laughs> it's relevant to the question I'm asking, or I'm trying to ask anyway. Um, do you focus on that in terms of teaching that uh, specifically? Well, to be honest, this this book, The Mindful Musician, Mental Skills for Peak Performance, is sort of a, almost a retrospective of things that I've done with my students in the past that have worked really, really well. So going forward, as I get new students, I don't really put them on any kind of a program or a curriculum, but based on their interest and their experience with performance and what I think they need, um, I'll assign them, you know, guided meditations or little activities and assignments. Um, but it's not like um, a book that I, I use as a textbook. So talk a little bit about what you refer to in terms of in the past teaching students about uh, peak performance, musicians. How, what shape did that take? What did that look like? Well, I'll tell you what that looked like. That looked like me getting lost in hundreds of psychological studies, mostly from the sport psychology literature. Um, I think that sort of branch of cognitive psychology contains the most valuable um, information right now for musicians, just because the, the athletes and their coaches and their sports psychologists have been ahead of us for many decades. So I would find, you know, these studies where they tried something with these Olympic level athletes. And I thought, well, hey, my pianists are Olympic level athletes. They just use different muscles and different joints and they use their, their bodies differently. And so I would try some of these, um, some of these techniques out on my students, not in any kind of a clinical study. I didn't want to do research. I just wanted to do, I just wanted to be a good teacher. So I just put it into practice and some things worked really, really well. And so the next year I would sort of refine the assignment or the activity until I could tell either by student feedback or by how they were uh, engaging in the activity that hey, you know, maybe some other musicians might like to to try some of these things and see if they work. Can you give us an example? Is that possible? Absolutely. Um, one of my more successful experiments with my students um, was around the topic of imagery, which we had talked about. Um, and, uh, you know, we tell our students to visualize, um, but we don't really tell them how to go about doing that. And I know that athletes have um, used visualization for peak performance. So one thing I did is I had my students write out their own visualization script, something that would um, be them speaking to themselves in about performing person. About performing music. Absolutely. As okay. if they're about to walk out on stage, what are they saying to themselves? Right. What's going through their brain? Right. Um, so that was a really successful um, experiment that the students actually kept repeating throughout the semester just on their own. And I thought this is a great way to introduce people to what would you visualize if someone told you to visualize? I see. And these were music students. Piano students preparing to perform Western art music from memory, which of course is nerve wracking. So, right. But the point that I, I get from this is the comparison to athletes who are able to train themselves to be focused in an undistracted way. And so you're making the connection between athletes that can do this and performing musicians that can train themselves. It's about mental training, right? Right. Okay. And, People have a lot of confidence in physical training, not so much in mental training. Uh, they think they were either gifted musically or not, but training makes a difference, and it makes a lot of difference when you're practicing meditation or mindfulness. Absolutely. And, you know, unfortunately, musicians have sort of uh, believed that either you, you got it or you don't, or you have the... The, the mental toughness required to be a performer or you don't. The difference is that athletes, you know, professional athletes actually have coaches and they have sports psychologists who train 
their minds. And musicians don't. I mean, we're lucky if we have a really good music teacher to teach us how to play, but we have to learn to be our own coaches, essentially. So I'm getting the feeling that you started meditation. By the way, you mentioned a TM. Why did you give that up? You know, I I just, I don't know. That was, I can remember, that was when I was living in North Carolina and I took some classes and it just, I don't know, it didn't click for me. I see, but you were still interested in learning meditation, so you tried something else. Right. And that clicked. Yeah. Okay, and... That came, you were either on a parallel path, you're a musician, you play piano, I'm assuming, right? Right. So you were doing that on the one hand, and on the other hand, you were learning mindful meditation. Right. And so tell me how the two came together. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, About 15 years ago, when I started to think, oh, how can mindfulness help musicians? At the same time, I was doing a lot of research on stage fright and specifically performance anxiety management for musicians. Um, Not so much because I was a basket case of a performer, but because I actually thrived on performance. I, I did get nervous. I did get all of those symptoms, but for some reason, my brain and my body interpreted that as, oh, this is so much fun. I can't wait to get out there. This is just going to be awesome. And, But my students, a lot of my colleagues and my friends had had a a very different um, sort of experience. And so, you know, we don't teach well what we naturally do well. So I had to really look at performance anxiety management and, and ask myself, well, how am I going to help my friends, my colleagues, but especially my students manage their anxiety. And that's kind of the track. Um, I started digging into the cognitive psychology literature. Okay. So I'm doing research in the psychology literature, but then I'm over here doing this mindfulness stuff. And then <laughs> I guess I'm a slow learner because at some point I thought, well, there needs to be a link between the two because most cognitive psychology um, methods have to do with directing the mind. You know, how are you going to think? How are you going to focus? And of course, Vipassana meditation is about watching the mind, watching right. what's what's there. And we really need to be able to do both. Absolutely. But you lost me there. I'm missing something on the both. You're observing the mind. <laughs> what was the first thing? Um, so what I was focused on originally was looking at the sports psychology, looking at the cognitive psychology, looking at, okay, you're experiencing this fear, this anxiety. How, how can you direct your mind differently to have a positive performance experience? And that tends to be, um, and I don't mean to overgeneralize and I realize that's exactly what I'm doing, but that tends to be, um, what really elite athletes and their coaches do You train the mind, you direct the thoughts very deliberately through imagery or other processes um, to expect a peak performance. Okay, so, but those of us who have been meditating um, realize that that's really not what you're doing when you're meditating, at least in Vipassana meditation, you're not directing the mind, you're watching, which is way harder to do. Sounds easier, way harder to do. Very good point. So the difference between mindful, mindfulness or mindful awareness and positive thinking. Uh, in positive thinking, right, you're trying to take something like a threat and turn it into a challenge. Right. Uh, in mindfulness, you're not trying to affect the thought or the reality whatsoever. You're just trying to be with it. Right. And uh, observe it and be with it from a critical distance, non-judgmentally, you're not trying to change it. Whereas in positive thinking, you're trying to change it. Right. Okay, so that's very true. Can you talk more about that? I, I can. Here's why I think the ability to observe the thoughts with some degree of objectivity, we can't always be completely non-judgmental or objective, but I think that's so important for all humans, but we're talking about, you know, music Because when we're engaged in the other side, when we're focused on a positive outcome, when we're directing our thoughts to, you know, expect the best, we're not allowing ourselves to experience 
all of the other thoughts and emotions that we're also having. It's almost like blocking them out. No, don't think about what scares you. Just look at, you know, when you're sitting in meditation and fear bubbles up, the idea is you sit with it. You don't try to get rid of it. You don't judge yourself for it. You don't say, well, if I were a better musician, I wouldn't be having these thoughts or these feelings. The thing that really bugs me is uh, maybe you've heard the phrase spiritual bypassing. And I didn't make up that phrase. I heard that in the 80s first, where you the idea that if something bad is happening in your mind, um, just just focus your thoughts elsewhere and it'll go away. And it's a way of of getting around, avoiding unresolved emotions that actually maybe we need to sit with. So the mindfulness opens the door for us to invite our anxiety to tea metaphorically right. and to sit down right. and say, hey, welcome. What you doing? Yeah. Hi, anxiety. <laughs> It's been What's, a, up? <laughs> What's up? It's been a while since you visited me. Uh, right. Welcome back. How the wife and kids? <laughs> you know, relax. Uh, we can be friends. That's right. Not real friends, like Facebook friends, you know. <laughs> but the, the, the valid point is that to know that I think the transition from mindfulness to positive thinking, which, which you're talking about, is... You know that you're having an, an anxious thought in mindfulness. Okay, I know this is just a thought. So you're not totally enraptured by it, captivated by it, right? You know it's a thought. And then the next step could be, well, I, I need to perform. So I'm going to take this anxious thought and turn that into good energy. You know, that's, that's going to be an engine for a good performance or, you know, a good outcome. Right. I'm accepting it. And... I'm also choosing to transform it or to set it aside temporarily. But it's that first step of acknowledging it for what it is, accepting that it's part of our reality. I think that has to happen first. Otherwise, you're not having a true experience that's true to every part of your body and mind. You're, you're blocking out a very important part of your our emotional makeup. Right. The realization of that that all these thoughts are there. It's like you have this quotation in the book from Mark Twain that I've experienced many terrible things in life, a few of which actually happened. <laughs> I love that yeah. quote so yeah. much. Speaking of quotes, how did you get Jimi Hendrix to approve his quote, knowledge speaks but wisdom listens? Actually, Oxford University Press didn't require um, permission for quotes if they're attributed to the author. Speaking about listening, we know that meditation practice and mindfulness training enhances the ability to listen in an undistracted way. Do you think the fact that you're a musician has a relationship to how you listen in general? Oh, what a good question. I can only speak for myself, and I'm going to say that yes, uh, being a professional musician, it helps me listen more deeply. But the flip side is because my analytical mind is always turned on, it's hard. It, I think it's harder for me to tune that part down or at least to sort of dial the volume down on the part of my mind that wants to analyze the chord progression, for example. So, um, so for me, Listening to music meditatively is a really interesting challenge um, because so many parts of my mind are, are going full throttle, you know. Yeah, I know that. I think listening to music in terms of meditation is probably a bad idea in general. Um, what I meant was more about listening in general, just listening in life, listening to people when mm. you're in relationships. Um that kind of listening. Yeah, I mean, I think, and maybe this has to do with my love of really avant-garde music that includes, you know, found instruments and ambient sound. And yeah. um, I do enjoy listening to life as if it was a fugue, you know, or a piece of music. 
Um, I do find myself, though, when I'm having a conversation with someone, like everyone else, I find that I have to really focus on what they're saying um, so that my mind doesn't wander because I really want to be present with that person. Um, But there are other times when I'm just listening to my car or I'm listening to my refrigerator that I think, oh, (laughs) it's a really pretty timbre. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, absolutely. You make a piece of music out of it, right? That's right. That's right. So you say something in your book that, again, this is not about um, peak performance, which is, you know, which is one of the reasons why I think your book has a lot to offer. You talk about how so many times musicians' self-esteem and idea of who they are is wrapped up in the music that they're making. And if for some reason... You know, the the music that they're making doesn't get the recognition they feel it should get, or maybe they botched something. Uh, It really depresses them, uh, or I should say depresses us. And you make the point that you are more than just the music. And uh, I think that's a really, really important point that all kinds of people in all kinds of uh, occupations or creative endeavors need to face that your purpose is limitless. It isn't just the song you happen to be writing or the painting you happen to be painting. But that's... It's it's beautifully put. I I just like the way you put that. And it's easy to say, and it is so hard to understand and to put into practice, especially when being a musician is such an important part of what we do. Um, It's really hard to separate that out. Um, The example I use with my students is if you're baking cookies and you drop an egg on the floor, um, maybe you get irritated and you grab some paper towels and you clean up the egg and you go about your day, but you don't agonize over that dropped egg for weeks and weeks after the event. You don't lie awake at night staring at your ceiling going, I cannot believe I dropped that egg. You know, I should just Maybe you thinking. don't stay up at night going, <laughs> why did I drop that egg? <laughs> My point is that our identity isn't wrapped up, most of us, most of us, yeah. in if we dropped an egg or if we spilled yeah. a glass of water or if we yeah. dropped our keys, we put it aside. But boy, when we screw up a solo, we do lie awake at night and stare at the ceiling and say, man, I, I shouldn't even be doing this. Yeah, and you're right. And it's so hard to make that separation because, you know, a musician that's really dedicated is going to think the most important thing that mu- that musician is doing in life is writing that song or uh, playing that song well. You know, that's that's who they are. If you take that away from them, they have no identity. They don't know who they are. And... Um, and that's a hard balance because, you know, that's that comes with the territory of being a, a, a true artist. And it also comes with the territory of just being a human being. You know, I, I write in this office that has this beautiful window and I look outside and there's this cat that I love watching. He's the stray cat. And he all he does all day is sit and blink. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this cat will sit, he'll blink, he'll roll in the sunbeam, he'll walk around, he'll sit some more. And I think to myself, all he has to do is be a cat. Like he's catting. He's not doing anything else. But we as human beings don't think it's enough for us to be human. We have to be doing something. We have to be productive. We have to contribute to society or create something wonderful. But what if we were all just giant cats, just being cats? I don't know. I guess yeah. not a lot would get done, but <laughs> well, the, to indulge our cattiness is uh, <laughs> <laughs> that keeps us balanced. You know, they're both necessary, right? You want to achieve, you want to create, but then just being, you know, you know, Leonard Cohen. I love what he said. He said that only one thing made him happy, and now that it was gone, everything makes him happy. Mm. You know, I know people in the music business, in the record business, um, some of them that had hits and that they don't have hits anymore. Or some of them right now are on top of the charts. I know people like that. 
and right. they're deathly afraid. They're getting older and they're deathly afraid. What am I going to do next quarter? Um, then I have to go in front of the uh, the board and say how much you know we made or the, the musician. What's going to happen with my next record? You know, and if that right. doesn't hit the same spot, then they're devastated and, and they have physical ailments. I mean, some people I know it manifests itself physically or they have addictions. You know. Right. And it's this idea that I always have to do something better. I, I have to do something new. I have to top the last thing I did. And, you know, people who grow, you know, farmers who grow fruits and vegetables know that after so many years, a crop has to lie fallow, like the ground has to actually sit and not be planted so it can replenish its nutrients. But we tend to think that we, we're on this trajectory of ever better and ever better rather than realizing it's a process. It's like an ebb and flow of creativity or maybe fantastic things. And then, oh man, I didn't produce anything great this year um, because we're not comfortable with that. Absolutely. Everything is a process. That's Life is a process. Existence, right? right? Awareness uh, is a process. So you also talk about uh, one conscious breath. And this is something that I can say that I believe it's true, but I don't know why. That, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh said that if you take one conscious breath, that's, uh, that, you know, just opens up your whole life, that changes your whole life. And you talk about how John Kabat-Zinn says, the little things, the little moments, they aren't little. Right, right. So... I'm just wondering from your point of view, how, how do you look at that? You know, I think, and of course, I'm not a scientist or a psychologist or a mental health professional, but I think there's some, I think the basis behind one conscious breath and the reason why maybe for many people it works is because it forces you to stop whatever you're doing. Um, and by doing that, you stop the story you stop the narrative, you stop whatever's going on in your mind. If for that one conscious breath, you simply look around, you realize where you are, how you feel, how you're sitting, what you're smelling, what you can hear, you know, you're truly rooted in this present physical reality for just one breath. Then it's almost like you've restarted your computer and you can go back to where you were or you can go to a different place, but it interrupts that inner narrative that is kind of a virtual reality playing inside our minds and it kind of roots us in the here and now. Very nice. So your motivation for um, pursuing the scholarship you did studying about peak performance was because you knew so many of your students and other musicians, but primarily your students were suffering from stage fright, performance anxiety, and you wanted to apply mindfulness to, to that, right? Right. Originally, yes. Originally. And then what happened? Well, you know, so I spend all these years digging through fear, you know, reading about fear and talking about fear and experiencing fear and anxiety. And our, our society tends to look at anxiety after it's manifested. And, and we tend to say, oh, no, you have anxiety. Well, let's give it a name and let's diagnose it. And maybe here's some medication, maybe not, but let's, let's deal with it. Let's cure this problem that you have. But again, if you look at some of the top Olympic athletes, you don't go on Amazon and buy a book for how to manage stage fright at the Olympics. You just don't find that because I think their training sort of leads them to focus on peak performance proactively rather than, oh, how can I combat this anxiety? So I think in recent years, what's really excited me is the idea that if we practice differently, maybe, or we practice well, or we teach well, or we engage with our instrument in a more mindful way, we can actually develop mental skills as well as physical skills that put us in a place to experience flow to experience optimal performances. And maybe a happy byproduct of that is 
if anxiety comes our way, we acknowledge it, we deal with it, but it's not this sickness that needs to be cured. I think it's a different way of looking at human emotions as we navigate, you know, just trying to figure out how to be a musician and how to be a better performer. So when you're teaching piano, for instance, are you weaving in some mindfulness exercises to piano students and say this relates to your performing? Yeah, I am. I mean, it's, I think it can become so embedded in our practice and in our pedagogy that it's almost difficult to separate it as a, oh, and here's this thing we're going to try. Um, you know, if a student comes in and they sit down on the piano bench and they say, oh, I've got this, this jury tomorrow and I'm, I'm really nervous about it. And I say, well, well, let's talk about the experience you're going to have tomorrow. What parts of that experience are within your control? And they'll say, oh, well, you know, we'll have this conversation about, well, you, you can control, you know, how well you warm up and how well prepared you are and what time you get there and what shoes you wear and if you're wearing layers. And, you know, and then I can say something like, tell me what things about tomorrow are not within your control. And those answers might be, well, mm. I don't know if the piano is going to be tuned and I, I don't know if my audience is going to like what I play and I don't know if the I'm going to be cold. So that's a way of engaging in a student and practicing situational control that directs the mind in a very specific way. But it's not necessarily an assignment. It's just sort of planting a seed of, hey, you could think about it this way. You don't have to, but hey, you could take all of your energy and focus on that which you can control and let the other fall by the wayside. That is so cool. That is great. And if they apply that to their lives in general, what can you control? And all what right. you can control. Absolutely. That, that, that's a major lesson. That's a major lesson that you cannot control things that happen. That's right. What That's you right. can control is how you respond. Right. And, and that is great that hopefully you're planting that seed that just, you know, springs up everywhere in their lives. Well, and that example right there, I think, is a good example of mindfulness first and foremost, because you're being aware. You know, you're not just, you know, in this narrative in your head. You're all of a sudden being aware objectively. Oh, this is the situation. Okay, that's the mindful side of it. Then if you choose to direct your mind differently, like, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to worry about, you know, if the doctor Snodgrass is munching an apple in the front row of my jury, I'm, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to focus on really being expressive and telling a story with my music. Okay, so that's sort of the cognitive psychology piece of not necessarily positive psychology, but choosing to direct your attention differently. Yeah. Beautiful. I, I love that, asking the student, now uh, let's think about what you can control. What you're doing is, is wonderful in terms of weaving in these broader psychological cognitive demonstrations within the context of teaching piano. You know, one of the first interviews I, I gave, they were asking me how mindfulness improves musicians' musicianship. And at first, you know, when I started this, I got very annoyed. I said, it's not about improving musicianship. It's about living your life better as a, as a musician. And I, I sense that, I, certainly from your book, I sense that that is a message that you're kind of working in to, and, and that issue about what can you control and what can't you control, that's a great example of that. Well, right. And I think it's such an important point you bring up, especially now that more and more people are realizing the value of mindfulness. You see books, you see, oh, just mindfulness everywhere. But of course, true to our sort of cultural norm, we tend to think of mindfulness as a tool, a means to a different end. So, you know, hey, can I use mindfulness to get over this stage fright or be a better? Well, yeah, I mean, that might be a result. But if you go into it thinking, I am using this tool t to affect this change, then I think that reveals a, a, a misunderstanding of what mindfulness is, which is to simply be in that present moment and and see objectively, not necessarily to try to change something. And it's easy to say, and it's just really hard to do, but I, I do understand your 
sort of bristling at how can mindfulness help students improve? Well, that would be great if that happens. But um, if you go into it with that mindset, it's it's just harder to learn mindfulness, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Hmm. So I'm intrigued by some of the things that you've done. And one thing that really uh, stood out for me was the fact that you spoke at an international conference on spirituality and music education. Oh, I did. Yes, I did. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you talked about? Yeah, sure. I was trying to think of when that was. That must have been 2016, maybe. That was a conference in Pachifstrom, South Africa at Northwest University. And um, it's uh, there's a, an international organization um, that sort of looks at spirituality and music education. And it was a really wonderful conference. It was a, just a wonderful trip. But um, what I presented uh, at at that conference, I can't remember the, the name of my talk, but the, the essence was, you know, music and mindfulness can sometimes result in accidental spirituality, for lack of a better word, because we we sometimes have what can be described as spiritual experiences when we're engaging in music. And we can sometimes have what we can describe as spiritual experiences when we're engaging in mindfulness. And I had just taught um, a course and I used as examples, some with my students' permission, um, sort of how my students' journal entries changed over the course of a semester, revealing some really really profound, profound insights for, you know, 18 year olds who are just looking to pick up an extra credit. Um, but that was a wonderful experience, that conference. Yes. Um, I'm hesitant to, to use the term spiritual. Isn't it loaded? Uh, it's loaded. Such a loaded term. I, I, I like better transcendent. Um, well, you know be, what I like is transpersonal. Transpersonal, I use that too, yes. Isn't that nice? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, Beethoven said that music is the mediator between the sensual life and the spiritual life. Right. And we, for so many different reasons, music and meditation, both, they're nonverbal, they're highly intuitive, focused, transpersonal. And they have that ability to go beyond yourself. Right. And to lose yourself. As Eminem said, you better lose yourself in the music. <laughs> uh, and, and that's, I think, the, the kernel of spirituality is losing yourself or understanding what your true self is, which is way bigger than the conventional idea of the self. Right. And it happens in these little nuggets of awareness, at least in this course that I was describing at this conference where students would sort of collect on a discussion board what they called epiphanies, like, hey, last night I had this little epiphany while I was meditating. And, you know, it'll just be a sudden awareness that I'm not alone or we're all connected or, hey, who is the I who is meditating? If I'm the one watching my thoughts, then Who's the one who's aware of that? I mean, we could really go down that yeah. rabbit hole. So it's those little nuggets of just being aware that I I hope stay with these humans for the rest of their lives as they continue to have these moments of um, just being present or being aware. Well, I think your students are very lucky to have you as a teacher Vanessa oh, Cornett. You. And by the way, I'm, I, I'm a believer that names are sort of um, destiny. And your name, Vanessa Cornett, you know, I don't know if most people know what a cornet is, but <laughs> it's a little trumpet, isn't it? It is. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of got a strange sound. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> it's it's kind of like a soprano trumpet or something, something of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so is there anything that um, we haven't discussed that you want to talk about or dig deeper into? Um, what do you think people want to know? What do people want to talk about? Well, I think one of the big topics is mental health 
and um, how specifically musicians practice meditation, how that helps them in their lives. Uh, yeah. not, not just better musicians, but live your life as a musician and deal with what we call the full horsemen of the musical apocalypse, which are <laughs> addiction, depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts. Right. And uh, how for so many of us, these practices have been very, very helpful. And they're certainly part of recovery programs of musicians that I've talked to who are uh, former addicts who we've had on the podcast. Right. I think mental health is such an important topic. I mean, now more than ever, I suppose. But I think mindfulness, not even meditation, just the practice of the, the basic attitudes of mindfulness can be so helpful when you think about um, patience, for example, mm. or you think about letting go. You know, I've, right. I've been carrying this grudge or I've, I've been feeling like a victim and right. am I ready to let it go? And if I'm not, you look at another attitude, which is acceptance, and you say, no, I, I accept the fact that this is where I am. I just, I think it turns our culture on its head because we're not trying to cure something or fix something or be a different person. We're just watching with, you know, non-judgment as best we can with acceptance, with generosity. Um, and we're asking for help when we need help and we're accepting our, all of our life experience, the, the good and the bad. And maybe we even get to a point where we can stop labeling things as good or bad. They just are part of life experience. So I am in complete agreement that um, even just a little bit of mindfulness or just a little interest in the topic can be uh, so, so helpful for mental well-being. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for thank you agreeing to be on this podcast and is there anything that uh, besides the book that uh, you want to uh, let people know about uh, no not really just thank you for having me in thank you for listening and i mean i suppose i would just say that if any of your listeners want to reach out they're welcome to contact me um I have a website, it's my name.com, vanessacornet.com, and they can contact me through that portal. And I open that invitation um, for a couple of reasons. One is that it's important to stay connected with like minded musicians who, you know, just want to get to know each other. But also, I've learned so much from hearing from musicians and music teachers around the world, their experiences with mindfulness and peak performance and anxiety management and, um, I love to hear of about people's experiences. So if anyone wants to share with me, I'll certainly be here. All right. Terrific. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. So Vanessa was a lot of fun and very informative. And uh, we have some great people coming up. So keep your eyes on the prize and give us a rise, a rating or a review. Tell your friends and anybody you happen to bump into on Zoom. And we would greatly appreciate it. I want to thank Lonnie Ronaldo and Hannah Bowers, the Hannah Bowers, for all their help. And until next time, let's stay in higher octave, despite of everything that's going on, and let's stay in tune.